This series is made possible by the generous donation of Stiefel Financial and viewers like you. Thank you. Looking at the world today, you may wonder, how do we begin to make sense of things? How can we solve problems when we can't trust the media, our leaders, or even the news? What's real, and how do we talk about it? That is why this series came to being. I'm Eric Tome, and this series, Where Do We Go From Here?, goes to the heart of things. We address local problems that have great impact by seeking local leaders and specialists to give us honest information that provides us with ways to move forward. Past episodes of this program can be found at the Nevada County Digital Media Center website. The program also airs and is streamed on the Government Channel 17, Monday nights at 7 p.m. at the same website. The series today will be addressing the candidates running for the NID Board of Directors. We'll begin by discussing this with Bruce Herring, who is the one candidate of two candidates for uh, Division Two of NID. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Eric. It's a pleasure to be with you. So what induced you, when you've had a career largely in, I'd say, more public service, uh, this is public service too, but, right. but non-elective public right. service, what made you think you what, wanted to what handle What made this? me do such a crazy thing? Yeah. Well, I never ever envisioned uh, running for any office. Um, um, and so, and, and most NID elections are pretty sleepy affairs. Mm -hmm. As long as you turn on the tap and the water comes on out, right. out of the tap or the hose, you don't think about it much unless you have to hook up or something or you have a problem. So I've had uh, no problems with NID. I've been an NID customer since 1990. Uh, my wife Sally and I are, are uh, organic gardeners and we have a small, we're amateur orchardists. Mm -hmm. So to be honest, I. Uh, my attention was piqued uh, a few years ago when they decided talk, talking about building a new dam. Mm -hmm. And so I, that kind of sat up and paid attention. And then I, I started paying attention a little more. I attended a couple of debates between representatives of um, NID on one side and the environmental community on the other. And so I learned a lot more about what was going on. And, um, and um, at one of those, someone just said, you know, if, if if you really want to make a difference and do something, why don't you run for the board? And I, and I felt like, oh my gosh, that person is talking right to me. And I've been retired for a couple of years, and I've, I've been, ha I have a great retirement going. I have a huge to-do list, mm -hmm. and my wife Sally and I have gone on some great trips. But I thought, you know, I think I can make a difference because I've been following water issues for 40 years. Um, um, I taught. Uh, high school for 12 years, and I, I taught government history and economics. And in my government section, what I did was, uh, in my government class, I always had a, you know, a federal, a state, and a local mm -hmm. unit. And so in the local unit, you know, we talked about the city councils and the, and the board of supervisors, but I also brought up NID, and I taught them the whole schematic, uh, the whole watershed. I had handouts to it, and I put the whole thing on the board in, in living color. Um, where how NID transfers water from the middle Yuba to the south Yuba to Deer Creek to Bear River and some of the major diversions and I and I asked them to to learn that mm -hmm. and so and so I also know that there hasn't really been a major dam built in California since the 70s there's right. been a few other off-stream dams and minor ones and so I thought well this is interesting why I, well, I thought the era of big dam building was over and so I started paying a lot more attention. That's what I thought when I first heard about the Centennial Dam. Um, what are they doing this? Mm -hmm. uh, it took a long time for them to come up with some good arguments, and now I found those arguments somewhat persuasive that with the change in weather patterns with, with climate change, there's going to be more rain and less snowpack, so we can't count on the snowpack to be a sort of reservoir way up in the hills. Right. And we may need some other form of reservoir. But um, I'm not convinced this is the best 
form of reservoir. And I'm also a little suspicious by the fact that they first proposed a dam in this exactly this location um, almost 100 years ago when in NID the, first got going. In the 1920s, yes, it was yeah. called Parker Dam. Right. Right. And then they tried it again in the 1950s. Both times it was rejected by the State Water Resources Control Board. I don't recall the exact reasons yeah. for why I think that one was. of the reasons in the 50s was I couldn't find any customers. Mm -hmm. But that was when the cat Nevada County was declining in population and just before the big boom. Right, and that was prior to the whole very intricate system I just mentioned called the Drum Spalding Project, right. which is done in conjunction with PG&E. I mean, it's an amazing system of about 10 major and another 10 minor reservoirs and diversions and canals and hydroelectric power plants. And it's an amazing system, really. And it includes a few hundred miles of earthen canals, as we all know who right. live around here. We walk our dogs on them and run on them, and, and it's, it's a great resource. Um, uh, the system works well, and like you said, it was designed to receive snowpack. Um, it's also a little bit uh, crumbling a little bit. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a huge backlog of deferred maintenance. And, 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 and one of the things that I would like to suggest is, is uh, you know, we've spent $13 million on this Centennial Project already, even before there's even a project. Um, and perhaps some of that $13 million could have been spent on some of the deferred maintenance. You know, the, some of the, a couple of the flumes are still wooden you know, date back to the 19th century, and they do leak. They were, so I, I think that's, that's one thing to look at is, um, hey, let's, let's really take a look at our whole system and fix the leaks and uh, repair what's broken and put a lot of energy into that. And of course, they do that. They have a regular maintenance department. I just think there's more they could do in that regard. Yeah, I think when they put the idea forward, they might not have expected too much resistance, although Maybe they should have known that Nevada County is very suspicious of dams. But um, I think they were somewhat caught aback uh, because they, when I first started following it last spring, they were saying, for instance, that the environmental impact report and the raw water master plan would be ready this fall. Right. That's not true. They're not going to be ready right. for two years. And I think they probably, I, I don't want to think that they were trying to pull a fast one, but it, they probably didn't think that people would pay as much attention as they have. I think they're a little surprised. So, so, so here's, what, here's what I found out. Mm -hmm. Like I mentioned earlier, I, started, I, go, I went to a few debates and I started attending NID meetings. And then I decided, okay, I'm going to do this. So I wrote an op-ed in the paper. And after you, you attend, you know, there's typically two meetings a month, mm -hmm. and then there's committee meetings, uh, several committee meetings during the month, too. So I often go to two, three, sometimes four meetings a month. And you're still married. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, have been since 1982. Ah. And uh, my wife and I raised two daughters here in Nevada County, and now they're flourishing young adults, you know, elsewhere. I didn't mean to interrupt you. That's okay. I, it's, I love, you know, I love my family, of course. Um, so, well, so what I learned was, in some respects, Eric, I think the dam proposal is really a symptom of a larger problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is NID has been so provincial for so long, and, and um, they do a great job. They have great employees. They deliver the water in a lot of places, and, it's, and, it, and it is a very complex system. Um, but like I said before, unless you have a problem, there's no reason to call up uh, in ID, it just right. keeps going. You, it's, it's, it's all good. So they are they they're kind of uh, secretive. They don't like to share data, even data that should be in the public domain. Um, uh, and you know, I just think they they think that they know best. Mm -hmm. You know, and and there's a lot of really smart people, not only on the board but in the senior in the senior management. And so, but it seemed to me that, um, like you said, they, they trotted this out before really thinking it through. And, and it's, it's, it's the cart before the horse. I mean, it's the old cliche, but it's really true in, in this regard. And so they have, re partly due to public pressure, partly because they realized they needed to go back and actually have a planning process mm -hmm. before they even go through with this. They've gone back and just this morning, um, uh, at the special board meeting this morning, which I attended, they approved a contract for a professional facilitator to 
commence with a two-year update of the raw water master plan. And that's what they need to do. But in, in my view, they should have done that two, three, four years ago first to, to, to oh, see absolutely. what's to happen. So, it, so the, we need to ask the right questions. Is there a supply problem if uh, precipitation falls more as rain as snow? I mean, there's a great deal of uncertainty of what's really going to happen, but most of the models suggest yes, and, and the data suggests that yes, the snowpack is shrinking. There's variation. Of course, two years ago was a pretty, pretty good year. Um, so is there a supply problem if that's the case? I'm not convinced there is. But that's what this raw water master plan was supposed to do. Let's look at all the supply issues uh, going forward, in, even incorporating maybe a generation or two looking forward uh, of what the growth demands might be. And also look at the demand side. I mean, I mean water can be uh, addressed from both the supply side and the demand side. And so that's what this raw water master plan is supposed to do. It's going to be a somewhat of an open process, not as open as some people were hoping. But for NID, <laughs> this is a huge step forward where even two years ago, even to get, you had to have, have to, had to write a letter uh, and ask for an audio transmission of the board meetings. So it's, it's, they go, they go about things in, I would say, a, an old school manner. So do you have specific suggestions on how they should change this, aside from making the meetings more open? Well, open communications and transparency, for one, and, and a greater involvement of the community. And this is what I mentioned at the forum the other night um, with all the candidates on the stage, is, is, like I mentioned a minute ago, there's some really smart people at NID. They know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, when they don't know what they're doing, they hire a consultant. And, and, and I think, besides just hiring their, typical, their usual consultants yeah. over and over, there's a lot of really smart people here in not only in Nevada County, but also um, we could tap into the Cal State system and the UCs. And so what, what I mean is let's, let's – Let's partner more with the people that are already here. Mm -hmm. like, uh, like right now, there's, even though they do a couple of uh, projects together, there's an adversarial relationship between uh, NID and virtually all the environmental groups right. in the county. And, I, I, and, I, and I'm kind of saddened mm -hmm. by that. You know, I, I think, well. hey, so I can understand maybe, maybe someone would say in the 1970s and maybe into the early 80s, oh, in the environmental group, that's a bunch of ragtags, you know, old hippies, and they don't know what they're doing. And, um, uh, you know, and they've done some really dumb things like, you know, blowing buildings up and stuff. And they did. So you could say the environmentalists of the 70s and 80s were radical. And I understand why, why someone from an, with an engineering mindset might say that. But, but we can't really say that anymore no. because in the last 35 years, partly because of uh, a great deal of research in the academic world, um, uh, the environmental movement and by learning from their mistakes, they have they have grown up a little bit. You know, they're much more sophisticated politically, mm -hmm. and also uh, the two that come to mind with the most that have really a lot of top-notch science going on is Circle and the Sierra Streams Institute. I mean, there, there are, you know, uh, masters and, and PhD scientists working for these people. Right. And so what I think is, it, instead of being so adversarial, we need to find a way to work together. And I, and I think that's one of the things I can provide. And, and, and here's why, because I, I, I come from both points of view, essentially. Mm -hmm. I grew up in a conservative household. Um, I, I voted Republican because my dad did at first. Me too. You know? Um, and, I, and I have occasionally ever since. And I don't look at things from, from a, through a partisan viewpoint. And really, this is not a partisan issue. We're all in this together, the people who live here in, in the Yuba Bear watershed. So part of my background, besides being at, at Bitney Prep High School, formerly known as Bitney Springs High School mm -hmm. for 12 years, was... I worked in a manufacturing firm where uh, I, was a, I was the purchasing agent. I bought the parts, and then I was the materials manager. Once the parts got into the plant, I would shepherd them through their way 
all the way to the assembly line and out the door, and I'd work with the production managers and stuff. So I understand the engineering point of view from, from that experience, but I also understand things from the river point of view. I was a whitewater rafting guide for 10 years and also a kayak instructor. Mm -hmm. I, I was half owner of Wolf Creek Wilderness, the kayak shop here in town yeah. for four years. And so to me, you know, there's no reason why NID and Circle should be adversaries. There's no reason why the engineering point of view, which is really important, can't sort of meld with looking at things from the watershed environmental rivers point of view together. And, and so I think, uh, since I understand both sides, I can speak the language of both sides, I can read a blueprint. Um, I've seen schematics of the dam and it makes perfect sense to me. Um, so. I'd like to just bring this together a little more and work, work together more with the really smart people that are already here in our community, along with UC and the state colleges. So that gives us a pretty clear idea of what, why you think you'd be a good board member. Mm -hmm. If you were a good board member, I guess your first activity would be to try to get more communication, more interaction with, with local groups. Absolutely. Uh, is that something you do on your own? Is that, I don't really know how the NID board works. Um, I'm sure that you, you don't go out um, as a group and sit down in the middle of Grass Valley and try to talk to people. No, no, because they, if they did, they, it would have to be a, you know, a, a, a form of meeting right. under the Brown Act. Oh, of course. No, no. and so, so, no, to their credit, they, they, ha they do a couple of uh, meadow enhancement and forest projects with the U.S. Forest Service, and they have worked with Circle in the past um, a, a little bit. And, and like I mentioned earlier, when there's something that's either that's outside of the expertise of the staff, they do hire either uh, a hydrologist or, or foresters or uh, an accountant firm as consultants or someone to do an audit or something. So they are accustomed to subcontracting out on a regular basis all kinds of things. That's, that's not new. That's normal practice been going on you know, forever. And so it just, I think it just needs to continue and, and inc uh, to a greater degree and include more people from, from right here who, 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 who know about the watershed, you know, pretty intimately. Yeah, I was talking with Ricky Heck at an earlier segment of this program, and we got into the question of NID buying the uh, power generating capacity from PG&E. Mm -hmm. uh, and some of the reservoirs, I think, were actually built by PG&E. Some yes. were partnerships between the two. Now, I guess PG&E is getting out of the electricity generating business, and I would think that. The fact that NID is now becoming a local energy producer and a green energy producer and a renewable energy producer would have so many Nevada Countyans just drooling to help them out. But that doesn't seem to have happened so far. And I would think this would be a great opening. Well, I think, I think uh, you know, I, I've had discussions uh, with, with the general manager, mm -hmm. uh, Rem Scherzinger, a couple times. And, and he is very interested in moving in that direction. And I think it makes sense. That's that's, um, you know, NID does so many things well. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's just everyone's got, the, the Centennial Project has caught right. everyone's attention. But um, that is an intriguing possibility moving forward. They've even uh, trotted out the concept that is new in California, these CCAs, community some, I was something about to say the aggregate. Same thing, but I, I couldn't <laughs> think what the second C route. Yeah, yeah, but it, but it's what it, what it essentially is, and this is it's working in Marin County. I don't know about Sonoma County, but several other counties. It's in, in Placer County, maybe a dozen counties in California. I might be wrong yeah. about that number. It's it's a move away from PG and E uh, to sort of more of a municipal based way to sell power. Now, PG&E will probably still own the transmission lines, mm -hmm. but they are divesting in canals and diversions and who knows, maybe even bigger projects, bigger facilities. And so that is something that is worth paying attention to, and, and I think NID is in a position to, to do more of that. I mean, they already generate, you know, uh, I forget the total, but, you know, um, maybe, you know, quite a few megawatts of electricity in about four different power plants. Right. And I would think that um, 
they claim that this is one of the reasons that their water rates are lower than those of other neighboring districts because they get money from the well here's why generation. here's why their their water rates are low it's because they subsidize them that's what I so meant. so to, so so to me that's the same problem we have with the giant agri, agri businesses in the San Joaquin Valley the water and the and the conveyance to bring the water is, is subsidized by mm -hmm. the state or federal government to me I mean uh, subsidizing the price of water sounds good, but whenever you subsidize something, I mean, there's got to be a hole somewhere. There's, there's, there's always a, a reaction, yeah. you know? And so the, the reaction in this case is that it's fiscally irresponsible to keep doing it because what they're doing is either taking money from the reserve funds, uh, which are really important in case something catastrophic right. happens, and uh, from the hydro sales, part of that is used to sub subsidize the, the water rates as well. So to me, uh, and there was even a grand jury report uh, six or eight years ago that, that looked at this, the Nevada, Nevada County mm -hmm. grand jury, the fact that they were taking reserve money and hydro money to pay for this, and suggested that if they kept doing it, it, it could lead to bankruptcy. So the board six years ago initiated a 6% um, rate increase across the board per year for the whole time. And that is now um, uh, run its course. And so they're, they are considering raising the rates again. Yeah, I may not quite understand this because I, I think that using the sale of electricity to subsidize water prices to me um, seems like a win-win situation. Um, it's not the same as getting money from Washington or Sacramento. No, 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 but in my view, it seems to me the, the, uh, the, there's three divisions mm -hmm. in an ID. There's the water operations is by far the biggest, mm -hmm. you know, maybe, you know, maybe two thirds or three quarters of the whole thing. And then there's the hydro and then there's the um, recreation, the campgrounds and boat berths and stuff like that. And so, but to me, yes, on the surface, that sounds great that the mm -hmm. hydro is subsidizing the water, but maybe the hydro needs to put its, uh, profit back into its, oh, its so I, I, I just think the water revenues should cover the cost of operations and it doesn't make sense not to I and mean, that's not really how you would you know run a, a business but then if they had a profit from the electrical generation what would they do with it just build up their reserves well I mean that's something that would have to decide w once that was before right. me if I was on the on the on the board and right. so but um but I would I would like to see the cost of um, water operations covered by water revenues. I think that's important. And that would be an increase, but uh, you think it's well worth it? Well, there's several ways to do that. I mean, there's what you can cut money too, but, but I, I, um, I think at some point, whether they do it this year or not, there, there, there probably will be a, a water rate increase and, and they would, and the, the rate would probably still be less than the neighboring water agencies. Mm -hmm. Now this is a year when there are actually three seats open for, for new members, actually two that are contested and the one that, that Ricky Heck has mm -hmm. essentially assumed because uh, she has no opponents. I don't want to mention any names, but if is there an optimum and a worst um, situation that could come out of this election? Well, I just think this is an opportunity. I mean, I mean, for all intents and purposes, uh, the current board, the status quo, is broken. I mean, like I said, they, um, they, they got the cart before the horse, not only in this, but by buying all that property in the right. Bay River Canyon, they have broken the real estate market. Um, you know, if, it, if someone wants to, uh, uh, you know, leave the East Bay and buy a home either on the Placer County or the Nevada County side of the Bear River within the inundation zone. I mean, they'd be out of their minds to do that mm -hmm. right now, even though the dam project may never happen. It might. And that's something we need to, you know, to look at. Is that'll be the result a couple years from now be when we get the results of the, of the plan, the raw water master plan, which I would love to be a part of. So I, I think th this, is, this is a clear choice. Um, I mean, my opponent and his family have, have been in, in Nevada County for 114 years, and that's great. Or maybe it's 116 <laughs> years now, I think he would proudly say, and I applaud that. Um, but 
he essentially, because he is the chosen successor uh, from John, John Drew, essentially anointed him mm -hmm. to run in his place. I mean, uh, he, he would represent the status quo. And, and I think it's time for a change. I, I think we need to move forward and, and look at this from a much broader perspective. I mean, uh, you know, take the entire watershed into account. Um, really think of, uh, think out of the box. I mean, I, mean, I mean, really think about this, Eric. I mean, to suggest that, oh, oh my gosh, it, there, there's a supply problem, which hasn't been proven yet. Again, right. that will be proven during the Royal Water Master Plan. And the only solution is to build a 275-foot dam. There are 1,500 dams in California. Um, if you know anything about economics, if you build one more, the the marginal utility right. you would get from that is essentially zero. I mean, and so, and, and, and they don't really come out and say this much, but really part of the reason for building the reservoir, it's, it's, it's not to in, increase water sales in this part of, of Nevada County. The, the dam is downstream in a lower elevation than this. The only, the only division that would benefit directly would be, would be in the Lincoln area to, right. to expand down there. But really, the, the, the purpose seems to be to, to sell water out of the district to make money. Water has value. It's very, very expensive, especially in a time of scarcity. You know, you can get, you can get more. So that seems to me what they're looking for. So that seems to be like, you know, let's, have, let's put the blinders on and just go forward. Instead of looking at what can we do to enhance the supply? What can we do to take a look at the demand in a lot less expensive way? and something that is, is beneficial. And this is something that the state really looks at, is, is, I mean, we're years away from even a vote on whether to proceed with the dam or not. Mm -hmm. After the raw water master plan, it has to go through the state environmental review process, which would go on and on for a while. <laughs> then the federal environmental right. review process. After that, that whole thing might take a year. Then, so now we're three years away, then, in order for the project to go forward, and the NID has already done this, they have applied for an assignment of uh, additional water rights right. from the Bear River, b water that is presently unallocated. And so that would be a, a series of hearings before the State Water Resources Control Board, which is, which is anything but definite. And there are 14 agencies or entities that have protested that. Um, application. So, but here's one thing that the State Water Board will be looking at in that situation is, and this is ensconced in, the Calif in, in, Cal in California water law, is, okay, so you're applying for this water to do this project. What is the best beneficial use of mm -hmm. that water? Is it that project? So, I mean, they will seriously look at that. And so that's not a slam dunk that they would even get the water rights. Uh, you know, to, Although to I, I've heard, and I may be incorrect about this, I heard that there are already water rights from 1914 that have NID has not used, and it feels that if it doesn't use them, they'll lose them. Right, and so that's why I think we should use them. Yeah, we should definitely use them. But here's the thing: you don't have to use them to build Centennial. You can mm -hmm. you can use it. So the, qu the question that I asked, that should be asked during this whole process, is what is the highest and best beneficial use of that water? Mm -hmm. That's the question the state will want to know. And to me, there's a couple other beneficial uses that, uh, a, a couple other uses that benefit more people and actually help the NID service area to a greater degree. A and one is, we could expand public access uh, and uh, river recreation on the Bear River itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's only a couple places to get to it, and the people in Placer County love to go to those, those, at those places and play in the water and fish and pan for gold and uh, rubber duckies, and it's a class two kayaking run in the spring. I've actually taught people how to kayak mm -hmm. there. But, the, but more importantly, but that's important as well, is because that's a driver of the economy of Colfax. And so that would dry up. And Colfax is already right. sort of a... Um, Marginal. Yeah, yeah. 
is what the state actually likes better now than giant uh, surface water storage projects is something called a conjunctive use, where there's some comp combination of surface water storage and groundwater enhancement. And you know, way up here in the foothills, there's no uh, aquifer, so to speak. Mm -hmm. It's all just all these all separate up. fractured yeah. rock, you know, and, every, and, and all the wells. And so, um, but there is a, f a significant um, groundwater basin, j sort of j just right about the area where the Bear River comes into the Feather, mm -hmm. just east and south of that. So that area is north of Lincoln. And in my view, um, we could we could really work with our partners and make sure that that aquifer is sustainable all the way through the 21st century and beyond. And NID is part of a sustainable uh, groundwater management agency as required by law now. Mm -hmm. uh, the new law came out three or four years ago with our partners in that area. We partner with the city of Roseville, the South Sutter Water District, the city of Lincoln, Placer County, and the Placer County Water Agency, and there's one private water company down there. Mm -hmm. And so we all come together to um, make sure that that aquifer is sustainable. And there's no doubt in my mind that what the existing uh, uh, infrastructure from NID, which, I mean, the Bear River downstream of Combe goes into Camp Far West Reservoir. Camp Far West was built in order to uh, replenish that aquifer right. many, you know, decades ago. Um, and in, in times of scarcity, you know, the rice farmers down there, um, they pump the groundwater out of there. And so it's a tricky situation. They, but, but still, it's, the aquifer is way in a, in a much more healthy state than the ones down in the San Joaquin mm -hmm. Valley down there. So by focusing on that, I mean, you take care of Lincoln's water problems, you know, if, if you have a very healthy and sustainable groundwater basin that NID can help replenish when necessary. And to me, that is a higher and better beneficial use of those water rights. We're running out of time right now, yeah. and which is too bad because what you've been saying in the last few minutes has brought up at least two questions that I think are quite crucial. And I'm not going to ask for an answer right now unless you okay. want to jump on them. But one is that I know for many years courts tended to rule and plaintiffs tended to ask them to rule that highest and best use always meant economic benefit. And I think that is changing. It is changing. It is definitely changing. Uh, uh, the state uh, is looking at these things quite a bit uh, differently. It's, ev it's evolving. If you, if you think about it, you think, oh, water rights. I mean, there's pre-1914 rights, and then after that, it's um, you know, first in use. Um, you get senior rights and then junior rights. And during the drought, you know, especially the last year, the drought, some of that was stood on its head. And so if we continue, you know, as we go forward, just like it always has been really, and there's right. going to be regular old years that are just fine. There's going to be above average years that are yeah. very wet and years that are very dry. And so if it gets critically dry again and there's three or four years of, of a drought, which I'm pretty sure there will yeah. be, yeah. it's inevitable, then I think we could look to the state to step in there a little more and even and even get get more involved with what is the highest best beneficial use and and some of their rulings will be one size fits all we might not like it and but some of them might be good we don't know we just have to be able to be nimble and flexible with that and I'll just ask one other question, which I don't necessarily need an answer for right now, but which came up in the forum two nights ago at the uh, Peace Lutheran Church. And uh, that is, should NID or shouldn't NID sell water to out of the district? And the, the, I would say of all the questions I heard asked that night, that seemed to divide the speakers more than anything else. Well, except for the overall question of, of the dam. Right, right. Well, I mean, that, um, again, I think that's, even though they haven't stated this publicly, there is a, there is a report from the uh, Association of California Water Agencies that says in it specifically, came out a couple years ago, that, um, you know, more than half of the water earmarked for Centennial could, mm -hmm. you know, be d easily diverted to Folsom, which would go right into the Central Valley Project. And... Um, you know, as a, as a backup for Oroville and Shasta. And so, and so that's heavily on their minds. 
I think it's a slippery slope to go down. I mean, we already do a little bit, have sold. We're, we're currently not selling water south to our water district, but I believe we have in the past. Mm -hmm. And a little bit to Yuba County. Um, interestingly, from the district, from the NID's perspective, selling water wholesale to both the cities of Grass Valley and Nevada City is selling water out of district. Right, technically. Yeah, and no, but that's, that's important to them. Yeah, oh that, yeah. Not only that, and I think that's an issue to look for. I mean, so that means that those people whose water bills come from either the city of Grass Valley or the city of Nas Nevada City, they live in the hearts of both those towns, you know, they can't vote in this election for NID director. Mm -hmm. They can't. And so to me, I mean, that, that just doesn't make much sense to me. Okay. Well, we could ask so many more questions. This Absolutely. half hour has gone yeah. very, very quickly. I'm Eric Tome. I've been talking with Bruce Herring, who is a candidate for the District 2. Division 2. Division 2. I, always I know. Get that we, wrong. Always, we always get that messed Division up. Division 2 um, of the Nevada County, of the Nevada Irrigation District Board of Board of Directors. Yes. Do you have anything else you'd like to say to our audience well, before you leave? I would just say thanks for watching. Uh, this has been uh, an enjoyable conversation that Eric and I have had. This is an important election. It's not just a run-of-the-mill year. What we're deciding is really th the next board will decide the, the, the way forward for the next, you know, 40, 50, 60 years. And so um, you should take a pretty close look at that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks so much, Bruce. This has been another episode of Where Do We Go From Here on NCTV, Nevada County Television, also known as the Nevada County Digital Media Center. You can see this program on the Digital Media Center website. It also airs and is streamed on the government channel 17, Monday nights at 7 at that same time. And to repeat once more, I've just been talking with Bruce Herring, and I think there will be more programs on this subject in the next couple of months. But we did eight of them, eight or nine last spring, and I think those are still available. And some of the, they are packed with information. So go to the Nevada County Digital Media Center website and see what you can find out about NID. We'll be back.